So we've been talking about carbocations in the orbital picture, and uh, recall that our discussion last time was about, you know, if you think about a carbocation rearrangement uh, going from a primary carbocation to another primary carbocation, and you have this sort of intermediate geometry where the hydrogen is halfway shared between both carbons, is that a stable intermediate or is it more of a transition state? Uh, and the idea of it being a stable intermediate would involve three atoms, three centers, but two electrons uh, with a hypervalent atom, and we would call that a carbonium ion. But the question is, is that carbonium ion a transition state, like here, it's at an energy maximum, or is it at a intermediate but higher energy state, or is it actually lower in energy than either of the isolated carbocations? Or do we actually not even have these carbocations? Is this just sort of what the more stable state is? And the answer we're going to see in chapter two is it depends. So the best you can do is just anticipate the possibility of uh, a bridged carbonium ion being uh, important. Uh, we're going to see the orbital picture for this a little bit later today, but here is a cyclopropane uh, ring, and here is appended to it a CH2 group that's positively charged. We call this a cyclopropyl carbinyl cation, and there is strong evidence that this is more stable than you would expect for a simple primary carbocation. Uh, again, we'll see some of that evidence in chapter two, but uh, what seems to be going on is uh, a, a set of resonance structures in which this bond here in blue, the electrons in that bond are delocalized. They can be, if we number the atoms here, maybe it'll be a little bit clearer. Are you recording? No? Yeah, yeah, we're recording. One, two, three, and four. So the bond between two and three can shift over to become a bond between one and three, and that uh, opens up this three-membered ring into a four-membered ring, and now the positive charge, instead of being on carbon one, is on carbon two, okay? So that's, that's just resonance. We haven't moved any atoms. We've just moved a bond, okay? Uh, and you could draw another resonance structure in which you take the electrons from here between one and three and move them to make a pi bond between one and two. And uh, that would give you this open structure with now uh, the positive charge on carbon three instead of on carbon two. And uh, all of those resonance structures that we just did, we could also have done for the red electrons. And because this is a carbocation that uh, is stabilized, looks like it's stabilized by resonance, but it's not the typical resonance with a pi bond, uh, we call this a car, we call this a non-classical carbocation. And uh, the reason you can call it a carbonium ion is if you look at this single carbon, um, Sorry, if you look at this carbon here, it looks like it's forming a bond with uh, one, two, three, four, and five carbons. So it's hypervalent. Uh, and this one, two, three center, you have a three center, two electron bond, okay? All right, and we'll see that actually come up a little bit later in an important biological uh, mechanism. Another classic example of a, that's funny, a classic example of a non-classical carbocation is what's called the norborneal cation. And it's a bicyclic system. If you look at it from above, it would look like this. And it's sort of, 
a physical organic chemist's playground and became pretty popular in trying to tease out whether these non-classical carbocations were real. Um, but uh, if you, you have a positive charge at this secondary carbon, and there's a nearby carbon-carbon bond that uh, is held pretty close there. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually color that red. And we will number atoms maybe one, two, and three. I think that'll be sufficient. So uh, one resonance structure is to take the electrons in the bond between one and two and make a bond between one and three. Now I know that looks weird from this drawing, though if we were to uh, make a model of this, you would see that carbons one and three are not that far from each other. Uh, similarly, we could move the electrons between one from uh, between one and three instead to make a pi bond between two and three, leaving a positive charge on one. And uh, again, the conclusion would be if you are, let's see, The conclusion would be um, that, I'm trying to figure out which one, yeah, uh, this carbon here, carbon one, is the hypervalent carbon because it looks like it's bonded to both carbons two and three. So again, this is a carbonium ion where you have three atoms involved in a sort of delocalized two electron bond. You can think of this in terms of resonance. You can also think of it in terms of MO theory. In just a little bit, I'm gonna show you what the MO theory tells you for the orbitals in this system. It's really kind of uh, cool. Uh, this system is complicated enough that we won't worry about the MO picture there. All right, any questions about what a non-classical carbocation is? It's non-classical because it isn't a localized carbocation, but it's also not stabilized by, it's not, it's not adjacent to a pi bond. Um, if any of you get into what's uh, terpene chemistry, uh, sometimes there are important non-classical carbocation intermediates that are involved in rearranging terpenes into more complicated structures. Okay. Um, anything else you want to say about that? Uh, so, you know, incidentally, you can, you can always write, if you need to write questions for students someday and, and you want to throw a difficult one at them, uh, you can give them a mechanism that requires them to go through one of these, and the arrow pushing is somewhat challenging. Once you've seen it, it's not so bad. But. All right, um, I wanna talk about the MO picture for, cyclo, for this cyclopropyl carbinyl system. But before we do that, we just need to deal with cyclopropane by itself. Um, in the picture of cyclopropane, based on valence bond theory, you've kinda got some problems in the sense that you're saying that each of these carbons needs to be sp3 hybridized because they're bonded to four different things and yet the anticipated bond angle for cyclopropane would be 109.5 for tetrahedral but actually the bond angles here because they're in a triangle are constrained to be 60 degrees. And so you might think, and, and, and we typically explain this in terms of what we call strain energy, which involves the fact that in order to make these bonds, these carbons would have to distort their hybridization. 
Um, molecular orbital theory doesn't necessarily require the idea of having an sp3 hybridized carbon that you just take those central orbitals and go <laughs> and squeeze them together. Um, instead, if you view cyclopropane from the side, I'm going to try to do this. What if you saw cyclopropane and we're sort of looking at it on its edge. Carbon one here is coming out towards us. Um, what if you saw each of these as being, each of these CH2 groups as just being one of our bent CH2s? What if you brought three bent CH2s together? And could you model it that way? If you did that, you would be thinking about, say, um, sigma outs, for example, if you remember what a sigma out looks like for our bent CH2 group. Uh, it would be something like this. And the sigma out would point straight into the middle of the ring. Uh, and so you're not necessarily having to deal with actually making bonds in this direction, but instead can just have overlap of orbitals where the, where the lobes overlap. So I'm going to show you just a few of these. It's not, uh, it's not important that you be able to generate these orbitals from, from memory or anything like that. Uh, I'll point out when we get to what the homo uh, of the molecule is and, and what the, uh, then I want you to be able to see how that works. Um, your, your approach then is going to be to take three group orbitals from, uh, from a CH2 group, so starting with the sigma, sigma CH2, and mix them together in uh, the three different unique combinations. So the lower energy one is where they're all together in phase, and this, if Let's see, I think we can, maybe Spartan will let us draw cyclopropane so you can sort of see what that looks like. All right, that's the lower energy sigma CH2s all together in phase. All right. um, now let's go back to notability. If we bring one of them and the other together uh, with opposite wave function sign, the third one actually lies along a node. Alternatively, you can have two with the same wave function sign and then the third with the opposite wave function sign and then the node sort of bisects the molecule like this. Um, and we'll see that over in Spartan. Here's the one where the node bisects the molecule. Here are two of the bent CH2s together in phase. This is the third that's out, uh, or the opposite wave function sign. And then this is the one where you have two CH2s that are opposite wave function sign, and the node intersects the third CH2 group. All right. So, uh, and we can do that with a lot of the other orbitals. Um, for example, uh, similarly with the pi CH2s, you can imagine bringing all of those together uh, with the same wave function sign. I've tried to draw this here, but rather than do that, uh, let's just look at it in, in Spartan. So the next higher orbital, do you see how there's a node in the plane of the ring? Okay, But above and below, there are lobes of electron density. This is what you get if you mix the two, all three of the pi CH2s together in phase. Um, then, uh, similarly with the sigma CH2s, you can have a couple of different pi CH2 orbitals. One where these two CH2s are together in the, with the same wave function sign, then there's a node here that sort of bisects the ring. Uh, the other geometry, again, is going to be very familiar. It's going to look like you have two pi CH2s adjacent to each other, change in wave function sign, and the node incorporates the CH2 group. 
All right, so so far, the geometry is working out great uh, for bringing together these bent CH2 groups. Um, one of the important ones that you can put together are, is to bring the three sigma outs together. We won't worry about the higher energy combinations which end up being anti-bonding and, and we'll, we'll uh, not worry about them. This sigma out uh, orbital that we make from having three sigma outs both oriented towards the center of the ring provides a really stable high overlap uh, combination which we can see over in Spartan again with this orbital. Okay, uh, you have the sigma out orbitals with the lobes on the CH2 groups in red, on the CH2 protons, and then in the middle with opposite wave function sign, you have a lobe that forms from overlap of those three uh, sigma outs. Um, for star, there's no Star Wars nerds here, I'm sure, but um, yes. This this one is very stable because. It, it kind of upsets another atom because all the, um, the, 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 the what do you call it, they are all considered at the, at the center of the, of the molecule. Right, so um, this is particularly stable because it provides good sigma type end-on-end -end overlap and you'll, you would notice that electrons that spend time in this orbital get to experience three nuclei all sort of close together. So that's a low energy combination. And interesting, it's lower in energy than those two of the other pi CH2 combinations that we saw. We wouldn't necessarily need to predict that, but we're not surprised that the sigma out type orbital is so low in energy. There is a particular version of the TIE Fighter that first appeared in a 1995 video game that I played on my computer and still have today. Um, and it was also featured in uh, the Star Wars Rebels comic. It's called the TIE Defender, but anyway, sorry. <coughs> That's neither here nor there. Nerd. Um, Dr. Savage once stopped by my office and uh, saw all the toys I have, and he said, you know, in my family, I'm considered a nerd, but you really, you really take the cake on that one. I would, def I would defeat Dr. Savage in a nerd competition. Okay, so um, if you think about bringing these three CH2 groups together, We've dealt with the sigma CH2, the pi CH2, and the sigma out. What we haven't dealt with is that p orbital that's perpendicular to the CH2 group. So here we're looking at the CH2 groups on their sides, right? And this p orbital lobe is coming out towards us and then out away against us, um, uh, perpendicular to the plane of the page. And if you try to bring these together, what you see is that there's no good way to have three p orbitals overlap with each other all the way around the ring, right? Um, so here's one option. You can have, let's just call carbon one, two, and three. You can arrange th things such that um, the p orbital on carbon one overlaps with the p orbital on carbon three in phase. And if you do that, you will similarly have overlap of this lobe of the p orbital on carbon three with this lobe of the p orbital on carbon two in phase. Those sort of look kind of like parts of a pi bond, just not sort of parallel to each other. But if you do that, there is going to be an out of phase interaction here. Okay. And so this orbital is going to have a node here and sort of also one here. Um, the other possibility would simply be to have uh, orbitals on one and two be together um, with the same phase. And then three would be sort of a weird uh, combination that would overlap Three is difficult to predict. I'm drawing what the results of the, of the uh, calculations are, though I wouldn't expect you to generate this one. 
Uh, these are sometimes called Walsh orbitals, and they come from, again, this weird overlap between P orbitals that are sort of arranged perpendicular to the CH2 group. Um, but you can, and then there's a higher order, higher level antibonding combination. But you can see that uh, this kind of bonding is more side by side pi type bonding than end on end sigma type bonding. And so you would expect cyclopropane to have some alkene like or pi bond like reactivity. You would expect it to be more reactive than just a regular saturated hydrocarbon. And we can look at these orbitals in Spartan. They're both highest occupied orbitals. So this is the weird one I told you not to necessarily worry about, but this is the one where I have um, a p orbital on this carbon overlapping in phase with a p orbital here, and then there's another here that overlaps. There's a node here and there. Okay. All right. Questions about that? So, what does this have to do with non-classical carbocations? Let's now imagine a situation where we take. a cyclopropane, and we're going to try to remember what this orbital looks like, and let's put a carbocation adjacent to it. So um, I'm going to erase the nodes just to avoid uh, confusion, and we'll continue to number the carbons, one, two, and three. Instead of having a proton here, Let's take, um, let's take this carbon and the proton going back, and let's make this a, uh, another CH2 group with a positive charge here. Now, what do you, what do you expect? is the best geometry for that CH2 uh, group. So here's the cyclo, oh man, terrible triangle, but whatever. Here's the cyclopropane ring. Here's our CH2 group. Is it best to have that group oriented in the plane of the page, or is it best to have it twisted so that the protons are coming up out at you and back away from you in this fashion. What do you think is better? Better. Would it be twisted so that it can line up with those um, highest, highest orbitals? So what can line up? Uh, sorry, the uh, pi CH2 orbitals can line up with those uh, Okay. Right, so you want something to be able to line up with the HOMO in the, of these Walsh orbitals. And it turns out this geometry is best because it takes your high energy empty P orbital and it causes that to line up with a filled orbital. Um, you could imagine doing the same thing kind of thing with the pi CH2 as you just suggested, which would have been uh, this kind of situation. The, the issue with that is just that um, that would still leave the 2p orbital not involved in bonding at all. Um, so if you line it up this way, you now have overlap of the p orbital with the HOMO from cyclopropane. And um, you know, now we could say, well, what does that look like? And we could draw a lobe of electron density there and another lobe of electron density here out of, out of phase. And it looks very much like resonance, right? It looks like we've got three carbons here sharing and three carbons here sharing. And in that way, 
we allow the electrons in the HOMO to spread out and stabilize the empty p orbital. And then we would see, if we drew the minus combination, we would see that the LUMO would also be delocalized across the whole molecule, um, which I, I suppose we could draw. The LUMO combination is probably um, oops. The LUMO combination is probably this one. So this sort of gives you a sense for what we were talking about when we, uh, in terms of the MO picture, when we said stuff about cyclopropinyl carbanion or car carbocation, wherein I could take this bond in blue and delocalize it to form a bond here. Um, I'm getting mixed up. And a pi bond there. And then similarly, we could have um, done a similar thing here in red where you've got two electrons delocalized here and another two delocalized there. And that's, that's the picture of um, bonding uh, and delocalization that, that the MO uh, theory is going to get us. Okay? So when you see a cyclopropinyl, right, cyclopropyl carbinyl, the heck is it called? I'm going to get that wrong. Cyclopropyl carbinyl cation, that's a situation where uh, it's stabilized by resonance and where you can move electrons around to change, uh, to change bonds in ways that you wouldn't normally expect to be able to do. Um, there's a number I want to look up from chapter two because it, it fits right now. Um, so you can use something called hydride uh, affinity in the gas phase to assess the stability of carbocations. And if you compare this carbocation with this one, same number of carbons positive charges on the same type of thing. The only difference is we haven't got a bond there. Right? Uh, the hydride affinity, and in this case, the lower the number, the more stable the carbocation is. Uh, this is a gas phase experiment where you measure basically how much does this thing want to be reduced by H minus. Uh, and the numbers, though the, the trend is, is useful, the numbers aren't uh, important. 249 for this one, and these are, I think, in kilocalories per mole, whereas 265 for this one. So that's um, a fairly large amount of stabilization, about 16 kilocalories per mole. And that's exactly the same kind of stabilization that you see uh, when you compare things that are stabilized by resonance to things that are not. All right. Um, with that in mind, we can go ahead. Do you have a question? No? I saw you were just moving your hand. OK. Adjusting my glasses. Adjusting glasses is allowed, so we can do that. <laughs> um, with that, we now uh, can look at a key reaction in the biological synthesis of cholesterol. And this is the. Uh, synthesis of the molecule squalene, um, which is a one, two, three, a triterpene. Okay, you get squalene from farnesyl pyrophosphate and another molecule of farnesyl pyrophosphate. I haven't drawn drawn out the pyrophosphate group. It has 
uh, three negative charges, though it's probably, uh, it's probably chelated to a magnesium divalent cation. So uh, anyway, and you can think of it as a, as a really good leaving group. Um, if you have, you guys learned about isoprenes and terpenes before, okay? So you can identify, I usually number the atoms of a terpene like this, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Uh, you may number it differently, that's fine. Um, but notice that each of these isoprene units is connected five to one right, head to tail, sort of. And same thing over here with farnesyl pyrophosphate. But in the squalene reaction, uh, in the reaction that generates squalene, uh, it's, I numbered differently here, which is dumb. I should be consistent. So in the reaction that makes squalene, you take two farnesyl uh, structures and you connect them head to head or tail to tail or however you want to describe it. Instead of five to one, it's five to five. And that's uh, unusual. And if you look at what we're doing, we're replacing two carbon heteroatom bonds with a carbon carbon bond. That's a reduction. And so this requires an equivalent of NADPH, which delivers a hydride um, and, and causes this to occur. Now for terpene chemistry, making bonds uh, one to five or five to one is actually really easy. All you have to do is take um, this isoprene unit and uh, have the leaving group leave to give you a carbocation, right? And it's resonance stabilized. And then you can have this isoprene unit uh, come in and the pi bond attacks at that carbon and then you get a new carbon-carbon bond and so on. You've seen that kind of thing before? Yeah. All right. So uh, it's more difficult to uh, connect five and five. Just imagine both of these leaving group leaves. You have leave, both of these leaving groups leave. You would have then have cations on both carbons five and there's no bond making to do there. So what happens? Well, uh, the first step is that the pyrophosphate leaving group leaves and you get a resonance stabilized carbocation. Then in a second step, you have this pi bond attack the carbocation. So, so far, just sort of what you would expect. But then what happens next is weird. So an enzyme removes a proton from this carbon one. And that's, the fact that that should be possible makes some sense. This is an allyl proton, and so it should be more acidic than a regular hydrocarbon type proton because resonance stabilization. You remove that proton, and then the negative charge attacks carbon three, where there's a positive charge, and we just made a cyclopropane ring, okay? Uh, now I'm abbreviating stuff so we don't have to continue to draw. Um, this is carbon uh, one here. R is the rest of all of this. Uh, these are carbons two and three. This is the pyrophosphate group on carbon one. And this is carbon three, which is attached to a methyl group and then the rest of this. So that's a cyclopropane ring. Um, I, I, if you'll forgive me, I'm sorry, the, the way, way I chose to number these things, I started one, two, three, and four. So that's where the numbers are coming from. I'm sorry about that. So what we need to do is get a bond between one and one. All right, now, what do you think we're gonna do? You've got a good leaving group here. You've got a cyclopropane ring here. What do you predict is, is going to be the first step? At first, we'll need the carbon carbon bond cation, right? The, the, the okay. It leaves, right? Okay. And then Good. We want that group to leave. And uh, why can it leave? 
And the answer is that when it leaves, what you've got is a carbocation adjacent to a cyclopropane ring. Oops, which puts you in exactly the situation. Man, color is going to be useful. Sorry. This puts you in exactly the situation that we were in a couple of minutes ago where we saw that uh, cyclopropane rings can stabilize cations by resonance. All right. I think it's going to be useful to continue to use the same color scheme, so I'm sorry I'm taking time for this, but not that sorry, I guess. And then let's see, on this carbon we've got the methyl group and another R group, three, two, and one. Okay, good. Now, if we remember what we saw before with this picture of stabilization and resonance in a cyclopropyl carbinyl system, can anybody think of a way I could get a bond between carbon one and carbon, car orange one and purple one? Okay, yeah, if I did a deprotonation reaction, certainly then I could make another bond there with the negative charge. But remember that by resonance, any, uh, both of these bonds, the one between uh, one, purple one and orange two, and the one between orange two and orange three, both of those could be rearranged to make a new bond between uh, involving carbon one. Uh, for example, we could, and you could push arrows here, but uh, at the same time you could imagine that these are resonant structures of each other. Let's have this bond between one and two break to make a new bond between uh, purple one and orange one. And I'll draw that here. If we do that, that's going to leave a positive charge on carbon two. Okay. Um, then what? What's that? The top is no longer positive. Good. Thank you. So this is now our four-membered ring. Um, I can then shift this, these electrons over to make, sorry, And again, the question is, is this, a, is this just a resonance structure or is it a different kind of intermediate? I think that question is somewhat controversial, but you would get here. Notice that what we just did there, if you go back and look at squalene, uh, we want to have a pi bond between two and four, or rather, <sighs> sorry about that, man. Times. I believe below we've numbered one, two, three, and four, and similarly one, two, three, and four. So we need a pi bond between two and three, and if you look at what we've done down here, we've just made that. And now we have a positive charge on carbon one, and it's actually resonance stabilized because there's a pi bond immediately adjacent to it. It's at this stage then that NADPH can deliver its hydride. Um, I don't know if you've seen the structure or the business end of the NADPH molecule. Uh, 
you've got two hydrogens here, and if you move electrons this way, that way, you can actually hand off a hydride to that carbon. And then at that stage, you've got squalene. Okay, so while we've been sitting here talking about this, um, our cells have been doing this all along even before people knew what non-classical carbocations are. And there's, there's good evidence for this being a key intermediate in this process. Okay, so I think that takes us through the end of chapter uh, one. Anything you want to ask about that? This is chapter one, we'll start in chapter two. This is the end of chapter one, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yep, mixing the group orbitals together, then using what you know about that to make sensible predictions. We talked about non-classical carbocations, and, and it, in that case, we can use the group orbitals, but it will be probably easier for us to think of this in terms of resonance. Yeah. And also to figure out which is the homo and the lumo. Yeah, also to figure out which is homo and the lumo, yep. Okay, others? Okay, well, um, while we're on the subject of carbocation stability, that sets a subject that's, uh, that's also in chapter two. Chapter two is about um, structure and stability of organic molecules. We're going to talk about strain, we're going to talk about uh, rings, we're going to talk about um, carbocations and radicals, and we'll uh, talk about conformations of organic molecules. Um, so, let's see, I referred to what was called um, hydride ion affinity, and this is a way that we measure the stability of carbocations. And hydride ion affinity is basically the change in enthalpy from the following reaction. That is, how high up in energy is it to go from a CH bond to a carbocation and a hydride? And that, of course, ought to be uphill in energy. Notice this is different from bond dissociation enthalpy. Uh, in contrast, bond dissociation enthalpy is the following reaction. This involves homolytic cleaving of a bond to give you two radicals. Okay. So it's a different thing, right? In homolytic cleaving, both partners are neutral and just have a single unpaired electron. Uh, so you lose the bond, but there's no charge attraction between the two partners. For hydride affinity, you lose the bond and one partner gets all the electrons. So there is some charge, charge affinity going on. So the usual trends that you learned in um, undergrad organic apply uh, usually tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations are more stable than primary carbocations and uh, the reason for that you can now see perhaps a little bit more clearly uh, based on group orbital considerations if you think about uh, just plain old uh, trigonal planar uh, CH3, the LUMO of that involves this P orbital, but as you start to introduce adjacent alkyl groups, you provide a place for additional orbital mixing. Let's, for example, put um, a CH3 group 
here adjacent, okay? And what you would see is that we can line up one of the two uh, pi CH3 groups with that empty p orbital. That's going to have the effect of spreading out the positive charge on the carbon in the middle, and it's going to also have the effect of spreading out the electrons in this pi CH2 orbital. So in general, the more substitution you have, the more that can happen. You can also think of this in terms of hyperconjugation, where we imagine uh, that electrons from an adjacent bond are spreading out into the empty p orbital. All right. So if you want to put some numbers on that uh, in general, um, we can, it's important to compare apples to apples. For example, um, if, sorry, oops, meant to erase that. If you look at numbers for, say, this primary carbocation, and we look at hydride ion affinity values, in kilocalories per mole. Uh, the number for the propyl carbocation is 273. If you add an additional methyl group far away, uh, the stability goes up. Hydride affinity goes down by a significant amount. And what your text says uh, seems to be happening here is something that's called self-solvation. So um, in the gas phase, of course, ions are just by themselves. In solution, you have solvent molecules that can surround the anion and they will, or, or the cation, and they will distort their electron density in such a way as to stabilize the positive charge. The idea here is that additional methyl groups uh, far out in the molecule don't stabilize the positive charge directly by hyperconjugation, but they do provide more stuff nearby that can distort its electron density to sort of accommodate the positive charge. So if you're comparing carbocation stability in the gas phase, it's important to compare things with similar numbers of carbons. And so uh, that's why in this series of primary versus secondary uh, versus tertiary carbocations, I'm keeping the same overall numbers of carbons. Hydride affinity values here are, let's see, 265, 247, and 231. Don't worry about numbers, but we're just trying to quantify how much more stable things are. Uh, the primary carbocation is about 18 kilocalories per mole, less stable than the secondary carbocation, which is about 16 kilocalories per mole, uh, less stable than the tertiary carbocation. These are numbers from the gas phase uh, because these experiments are done in the gas phase. When you, but most of our work in organic chemistry is in solution. Uh, the differences in stability in solution are not as big as this because solvent tends to solvation tends to wash out some of those effects but uh, the trend sort of still holds. Um, let's see. The, I guess the last thing I'll mention and that we can pick up next time is the idea of non-classical carbocations. You can measure the extent to which you really think resonance is going on by noticing that hydride affinity here for this norbornyl carbocation is about the same as for this tertiary carbocation. So basically we think that the charge on this carbocation is localized because, because its stability it doesn't look like resonance stabilization. It's just the same as a localized positive charge basically. Um, in contrast, you can remove the methyl group and look at just the unsubstituted norbornyl carbocation and compare that to a secondary carbocation. And what you see is a much larger, you know, basically um, 16 kilocalorie per mole difference from secondary 
both secondary carbocations, and that amount of stabilization is about the same going from secondary to tertiary, uh, and it's about the same as you'd expect for resonance. So uh, this is evidence that non-classical carbocations are a real thing because this is resonance stabilized. All right, we'll say more about that next time. Yeah. I'm still not very clear about um, the coordinates when you when you are uh, trying to get your your p orbital and your maybe the CH two or the CH three. Sometimes you tend to draw the S up, and then sometimes you draw the Z up. So which, right. which one is actually because when you want to predict which one is going out of the yeah. plane, you want to use the coordinates. So which one do you right. want to follow? Well. Um, it doesn't matter which one is up, so long as you remember that um, that carbon has three different p orbitals to begin with, and they're perpendicular to each other. So you can choose your coordinate system however you want. Um, what we saw for the bent CH2 is it, it doesn't matter what, how we arrange things for the bent CH2 as long as we remember that the p orbital that's left over is the one that's perpendicular to the carbon hydrogen bonds. In other words, you could call this the 2pz orbital if you wanted, provided that you use the 2px to make this one and the 2py to make this one. Yep, see so ya. Yeah.